it's a pleasure to have Nicol Adas visit us and uh, give us a talk on lettuce order groups and free groups. Go ahead, thanks. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be doing research uh, with Peter, Jose, and Melissa. And this is, um, I'm not going to be talking about that stuff, that board over there, which is <laughs> our attempts. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be talking about lattice order groups and lattice order free groups. This is joint work with thesis, Gallardo, my PhD student. And um, let me just remind you of some stuff, what a group is. It's just a monoid with a, a single inverse. Um, lattice order group is a, a lattice order version of that where you have a group and a lattice on the same set, and you need some kind of compatibility between the two. Uh, multiplication preserving the order will do just fine, but equivalently, you can also ask that multiplication is distributed over join, or you can ask that it's distributed over meet. These are all equivalent statements under the group axiom. A pre group now, uh, these structures are motivated by mathematical linguistics, um, uh, introduced by Lambeck and studied by Buskowski. Um, is a structure with two inverses, a left inverse and a right inverse. So it naturally is an ordered version. It has an order for this to make sense. And the left inverse, if it's multiplied on the left, it brings you below the identity element, the monoid identity. And if, it, if you multiply the, the left inverse on the right, it takes you above. So that's how the left inverse work. And the right inverse, if you multiply it on the right, it gets below, and on the left, it gets you above. So these are the two types of inverses, and they have to do with how parsing sentences in natural language work and stuff. I don't know about what the mathematical linguistics aspects of this, I'm sorry. Well, this is in the algebraic structure. But you can also have a lattice ordered version of that, and that is a proper generalization of the notion of a lattice order of a net group, a lattice ordered group. Um, so now what changes is that. Essentially, it's the same thing as a lattice order group, but the, the group axiom is replaced by these weaker uh, conditions for the two inverse. Inverse in the third line, but it's L and R. Thank you. This is supposed to have two yes. inverses and an R. Right? Yeah. Okay. Then L and R will go inside. Yeah, actually, that's a good question. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Please ask questions. Yes. So, yes, if uh, you are abelian, then LNR will be the same. And then you will get an L group, which will actually be an abelian L group. Okay. All of these things are necessarily infinite. Maybe you already know that all L groups uh, that are non trivial have to be infinite. Because if you have an element somewhere that's not the identity, you can join it with one. And then you get a strictly positive element, and then you can take powers of that element, and they never stop because it have to be ordered according to our preservation, and they cannot collapse because we have a group. So all of these groups are necessarily infinite, but also a lot of free groups uh, are also necessary. That's one of the problems because you cannot have slightly small like, finite models and see how they work. Um, so they form a variety. Um, that is I, have, I have a question. Yes. So, like uh, in the group case, you have a compatibility condition. Yes. What happened to the compatibility condition? So, it is hidden here in the definition of a pre group. The compatibility condition is part of the pre group. Okay, okay. So, yes. So, sorry, I didn't mention it explicitly. Pre group has to be compatible. Pre group <laughs> itself has to be compatible already, even if it's not lattice order. So, it really is just replacing the this single inverse uh, with that. Um, so that's just the definition again with the typo. No, that's the lattice order group. So I'm going to spend some time just reminding you about lattice order groups uh, or introducing it as I've seen it before. The number lines are typical examples the integers, the rationals, the reals. Um, these are totally ordered, uh, but you can, of course, take direct products and go non not totally. For the stuff, or you can do lexicographic products. This also works nicely, replacing a single point by a whole copy uh, of another L group. Uh, if you want to go, all of these are commutative. If you want to go to the non commutative case, you do what you do for groups, you go to permutation. 
But now you just have to do order permutations. So instead of having a base set uh, on which you will be taking your permutations, you have a base totally ordered set chain. And now you can permute those elements, but the, the permutations should be order preserving. So you should have no crossing lines. So this thing is not allowed when you're doing permutations of the elements. Um, but these have to be. So they're order preserving bijections, or if you want uh, model theoretically automorphisms of this chain. Um, what the chain, I'm, I'm gonna be calling them symmetric L groups, symmetric group. Um, if your chain is finite, then you have to send to the bottom to the bottom because if you don't, then there's nothing that can be sent there because it will cross and you want it to be onto and then it's rigid, you have only the identity. So the automorphism of a finite chain is just the identity. The automorphism of the natural numbers is still the identity because again, you have bottom element you have to send and you have to go from there. Can you say that, that they have to be infinite? Before? The non-trivial ones have to be infinite, yes. Exactly. And the trivial one has just one element. So this is this example doesn't even come up. It's trivial. No, it doesn't so have one element. So it, has the, it has only the isomorphism. It's the identity. Identity is the only thing. Yeah, but it only has only one element. Right? Yes, yes. So, that, so that's not an example because it has more than one element. No, but it's the automorphism of that, not the, the chain itself. So yeah. Oh. So the chain C, as I the chain C, that for example, the chain C can be a finite chain, and by n I mean an n element chain. I thought it has to be infinite. So how can it be? An so the, the, cha the chain is a, an n element chain, and then you can take the group of permutations on this n element chain. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. And that group has n factorial many elements. Um, in that subgroup, you have to take um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Sorry, the order preserving ones. So actually, all of these symmetric L groups fit inside the user symmetric group. Um, and they are subgroups of that because the operation is still composition. You still have the same inverse, the same um, identity. Um, so that's why you do. You do look at all of the n factorial many permutations, but unfortunately, all of them break the order preservation property, except for the identity. That's why you have one element, the one element model here. Um, and the same mm -hmm. problem comes, even if you have an infinite chain as a base set, because it's rigid, again, you have to send the bottom to the bottom and then you have only the identity element. With Z, you have more flexibility. Now if you take Z, you have zero here. Now you don't have to send zero to zero. You have a single choice where to send the zero because after that you have to put parallel errors everywhere. So it's fully determined by f of zero. Um, this could be your, I don't know, n. And then you have as many as these choices, you have z many right. choices. So these are the translations of, of this chain. So in this case, the automorphisms of z set theoretically are exactly as many as the elements here. And what is the operation? The operation is composition. If you compose something with something else, you're feeding this into each other. So you end up adding the numbers. This is actually under addition. Uh, this is the first example. This is the very first example mm -hmm. here. Right. So in this case, at least you get a non-trivial algebra, but it's still very boring. It's commutative. It's the, one of the simplest uh, ones you can, you can imagine. Um, every non-trivial L group has this as a subalgebra, actually. So it's everywhere it's the most trivial one you can consider. But if you go to the real numbers, then you can do um, graphs of functions from R to R. And then you can order them by these being smaller than that, point-wise, and then the join. And then you can have things like X cubed, and 2x, and they don't commute anymore. So this is your non typical sorry, increasing. Thank you. So all of them have to be increasing. So these are not good mm -hmm. drawings. They have to do this. They have to keep going up, strictly increase. That was your question. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, yes. Mr. Uh, there is no second part these are torsion-free groups. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Torsion, exactly right. Exactly. And L free groups are also torsion-free groups. So um, this is the celebrated theorem by Holland that tells us Cayley's theorem, but for L groups instead of groups. So it tells us that every L group can be embedded into a symmetric one. 
Not as trivial as Cayley's theorem, because in Cayley's theorem, if you have a group, then you can use as your base set the group itself, and you can take permutations, and the left multiplication is the one that you take to represent this. Now you cannot do that because if this is an L group, you cannot take as your chain to be the L group because your L group would be non totally ordered. So you have to make it slender first by doing something clever. And yeah, you have to take homomorphic images of G that are chains. And the elements of G have to act on these chains. And then you stack them all the chains together and you have enough of them to separate points. So that's an idea. Um, the abelian subvariety is interesting, the abelian L groups, because they can be generated by this guy, this very simple, um, the simplest non trivial L group. The variety generates the HSP of the, is exactly the variety of abelian L groups. That's uh, Weinberg's theorem. So this tells us that if you want to check an, an equation in abelian L groups, it's just enough to, to check it in Z in generating algebra. And that you can do by some linear programming algorithms. So that gives you the stability of the equational theory of abelian L groups. And that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to get the stability result and generation results. So how does it work for groups? What are some generating algebras for the variety of groups? Well, the symmetric groups on countably many generators give you enough flexibility of permuting things to generate all groups. Or equivalently, the finite symmetric groups, the SNs, but all of them, to be sure. And I'll include the proof of that uh, this slide. Um, but let's see how we can expect to lift this for all L groups. The variety of L groups now, maybe it's the, you have to think the analog of S of omega is the automorphisms of something that doesn't give you something completely trivial because the, nat the finite chains and the naturals, the naturals won't work, um, but also Z won't work because if you take the automorphisms of Z, the symmetric group on Z, the symmetric L, group on Z, it won't do it because we said it's isomorphic to this one and that's abelian. So the most it can generate is the abelian one. So G is, so G is, um, G is the variety of groups. Of groups. Variety of groups. Of groups. That's just a fact that's known. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is omega is the symmetric group, symmetric group on uh, on countably many elements. Yes, and the S and are just uh, the user finite. So, so you have a choice: elements. one infinite or infinitely many finite. Okay. Would we'll do it for groups? Mm -hmm. So the same hope was naive hope would be that you pick one infinite. Right. But no, you have to pick the correct infinite one. It's not going to be the automorphism sort of Z that does this anymore. Right. Forget about the ones based on finite chains because these are trivial. So this is what I'm hoping for, but it doesn't work out of the box. But if you take something a little bit bigger, for example, Q or R, then the automorphisms on that um, are enough to generate the whole variety of them. So Holland's embedding theorem says that every L group can be embedded into the automorphism of some chain, but it could be huge, it could be infinite. If you just care about checking equations uh, and not just about quasi equations and embeddings, you can do it by just one um, countable chain. It has to be dense enough. Though. But it's not the size of the chain anymore that matter, uh, the base set, it's the density that plays a role. Okay. So that's called the generation theorem. Okay, so let's prove those two results, the generation theorem for L groups and the generation theorem for groups because they have exactly the same proof. So this is how you do it. Essentially what you have to show is that if an equation fails in um, the variety, it will fail in, in, in the generating algebra, the proposed generating algebra. 
that's a non-trivial derivative. So pick an equation and say it fails in the variety of groups slash the variety of value groups. And here I'm going to have a running example, which is commutativity, because it does fail in both. Um, then take, if it fails in the variety, it fails in a particular group or in a particular L group. Use the embedding theorem, Cayley or Holland, to embed that group that witnesses the failure into symmetric groups. So actually, we can now have a failure of the equation in a symmetric L group or group for some set C or for some chain C. So what does it mean that an equation fails? What does it mean that commutativity fails in permutations? It means you actually have two permutations, F and G, that just don't commute. In general, um, you have your equation, you have as many equations, as many permutations as the variables of the equation to instantiate the variable, and then you plug them in, and then you get different um, permutations for the two sides. What does it mean that two permutations are different as functions, it means there's a point on which they disagree. There's a point of the base set now, let's call it P, so that if you apply the permutation on the left and the permutation on the right, they disagree. Okay. So that's what the failure is. Now from this, we can extract the finitary part of this that's called the diagram, and that witnesses the failure, but not involving all of the elements of the chain C, but only finitely many of them. In my running example, I think it's five elements. It's these points. It's the points that you use for the evaluation. So for example, don't take all of the chain C, which could be infinite. Take the point P of the chain that you um, that witnesses, but also in checking this inequality, to check, you have to take P, you have to compute F of P and G of F of P. And here you have to take P, G of P, and F of G of P. So those five elements, which um, on the chain could be ordered as the chain tells you. So for example, you can have F of P here, and you can have maybe G of F of P here, and you can have G of P here, and what's the other element? Maybe F of G of yeah. P there. Um, is this is this gonna be? Um, I don't know because here, if I especially if I replicate those five elements, let me see if, if my example here violates any order preservation because p has to go to f of p, of course. Um, and um, g p has to go. So this is oh, that's what I'm going to use a different color. Now maybe black for g the g function and it tells you p to g of p and what other things f of p if you apply g to it you will go um, to g of f of p that's a black line no problem no black lines crossing and but this uh, what is this yeah. one, I have to apply F that. That's a problem now. Yeah, because that would be two crossing lines. So this cannot possibly be here. It has to be somewhere above this. Let me put it up here so it will be no problems. F of G of P. And that's where the other blue line has to go. Okay. So the diagram itself knows that locally there is no failure to the order preservation. Okay, so that's, that's what's called the diagram. And um, it encodes the failure in a finitary way. Now, the diagram, I, I chose a very simple equation. It doesn't have inverses, for example. But if I had inverses, some of them could be labeled by like something like G inverse. But I suggest the following. Instead of having an arrow labeled by G inverse, reverse the arrow and label it by G. That's an easy way to just uh, move from uh, inverses to just things that don't have inverse. And this is exactly what causes the complication in level three groups, that we cannot just simply read off the inverse because we have two inverses, the L and the R inverse of a function. And how do these work? I'll explain to you, but it's not just one line going back and forth because it's not one-to-one -one anymore. So, but that's the it's easy part. What, that's why the proof is easy for L3 groups and L groups because you have a single inverse, you can translate all of these things to just one function at a time, and that function can avoid having inverses on top. So um, 
That's what I call the diagram, as I said. It's just a restriction to this finite piece, um, the point of the diagram, and also I am asking you to uh, also keep these arrows. Not all arrows that happen to be, maybe there is another arrow uh, from here to there, another, uh, maybe there's a, there's a G arrow from here to there, who knows? Don't bother writing that. Only the arrows that are coming from the labels of the points are needed for this. Okay, okay. How, why is the diagram useful? Because now we can move away from this chain C on which we're gonna keep the failure happens to Q. This is the chain we want to witness the failure. Run. This fits inside Q because just pick any, any five different points of Q and put it in there. And then can I extend these lines? You can't because of the transitivity of the group. The if I give you any, if I give you a finite set of points and I tell you I want them to go there, then you have enough space to extend it linearly in between. And you now have actual functions from Q to Q. If it would be Z, yeah. then you don't have enough space. So you have yes. to have density here to fit. So for example, what I know about the function G, it has to send those two, but the function F, it has to send these elements to these, to these two. Yeah. And then um, if I have Q now, I have infinitely many points here and I have a lot of space here and I can just linearly extend this. The midpoint here will go to the midpoint of these and so on and so forth. But if I had chosen Z as my chain, Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, but Q, what do you need to stretch or? Yeah. Yeah, I need to stretch this to that. Yes, you can. You can use any continuous thing. Yes. Would have preserved. So for example, you can represent this as a constraint of having on the graph, P has to go to this point. So you have one point here, this is this line, and this arrow can be another point. And now I have to extend it to ah, okay, okay, okay. like that. So, yeah, oh, so that oh, actually see, becomes an actual order preserving function from Q to Q, which is an automorphism of Q. Okay, and I can do the same thing for G also. And they will be yeah. and they will be witnessing the failure because they still will be there. And you can still do the calculations the same way on those points. So in the end, um, G of F of P and F of G of P will be different points. So the equation will fail. Uh, in the L group case, you would have also wanted an example that then uses join and meet, right? It works the same way. It's That's a good point. Works. That join and meet have to be there, but you can massage the equation so that at least one of the two goes away. For example, the meet goes away. Because you can just, if you have uh, group equations, L group equations, you can always uh, multiply by the inverse and have one on one side. And then on the other side, you can have multiplication as we said, distributes over joints and meets. So you can push it down. You have a joints of meets. I didn't mention it, but um, lattice order, it follows from Poland's embedding theorem. The lattice of this automorphism stuff is distributed because they're based on functions on chains. Two, two chains, two chains. So they inherit distributivity of the chain. So meets and joints distribute over another, you can just factor one out and have only joints, let's say, of terms equal to one. And then you can actually change it to lesser or equal to one if you want, or greater or equal to one. Uh, and then it's just a matter of, um, so you have something like this. And you want it to fail, then this means that None of these evaluations, some of these evaluation, one of these evaluations will go below one. So you just have finitely many of these inequality things that have to be different. Um, so that's a good point, yes. So um, Holland and McCleary used this fact together with the idea of diagrams to prove that the equation of theory of group is decidable. 
Because now, if you give me an equation and it fails, it will produce a failing diagram. And if it does, if I have a failing diagram, I can get a failure in the in f of uh, q. So all I have to do is all possible diagrams to see that if they, any of them fail. So what is a possible diagram? Well, the points of the diagram are just look at the equation and, and read off from there what are the labels of these. Worst case scenario, some of these points could be identical. Um, actually, I think they provide an argument that for, for particular for n groups, and you can, you can assume that they're distinct, but even if you don't, if you can have some, not order on them, but pre-order to collapse some of these points. And uh, you check all of them, the finitely many. And Peter has done this. You can go to his website and you can just type in your uh, equation that you want. And it will run this check through all of these finitely many diagrams and tell you if it finds a failing diagram, it will give you the failing diagram. That's a proof that you can take it and extend it linearly. It gives you the counter example. If there is no failing diagram, the Peter's algorithm tells you there is no failing diagram. That's a certificate that you cannot possibly fail this equation. In any other group, it's a true equation. With, with George Metcalf, we also have another companion algorithm, but actually it gives you in that case an actual proof, uh, like equation of logic proof that your equation called. It takes the fail, takes all of the diagram that Peter checks, and out of them, it turns them around somehow and produces an actual proof. Um, in a Gensen system, but then you can translate it to, a, to an equation of logic proof. Um, Okay, so L pre groups now. How are L pre groups more complicated than this very well understood theory of L, L groups? There are tons of books written, conferences have been organized for years about L groups. How do we understand L pre groups? So, one interesting example is we relax the notion of the permutation. We don't assume that they're required to be one to one anymore. We allow it to be many to one. If your chain is Z, then I will consider all finite to one maps. So that's a picture of two examples of finite to one maps. You just take a finite piece and you send them. So it's definitely not on two, it's not one to one, but it's not infinite to one, it's finite to one. And the same thing here, you can just take a bunch of the whole interval and send it to a single point. Now, how to tell you how to take inverses of these functions. So let's pick the first example and let's try to find the inverse of the number two. And I'll do the left inverse and then the right inverse. So the left inverse is very simple. Um, I pick two because two is a point in the image. So I have choices of how to invert it. Which of these you take? You take the lower one. Because this is an interval, it's finite to one. And because of the other preservation, it has to be an interval. You pick the smallest element of that interval. And that's your left inverse of f of 2. Your right inverse picks the bigger choice of how to invert it. And anything in between, you ignore. How about an element that's not in the image? What do you do there? Oh, by the way, in this case, notice that the left inverse of 2 and the right inverse of Q2 are ordered so that the left is below the right. That's not universally true. It's true only for elements in the image. For the elements that are not in the image, the other inclusion actually holds. So let's take the left inverse of one. First of all, you have to pick which of the two pieces to try to find this in. You go up. You take the smallest element of the image that's above your one, and you do as, I as you would do for two. So the left inverse of one is exactly as the left inverse of two, which is one. So you go, the picture you have to remember for L is that you have to do this. And if you're already at that point, it saves you the upward trip, you just go down. But if you want the right inverse, you have to go left, you have to go down. 
So this is the L picture, the R picture is this. So it's gonna be the same thing as the right inverse of zero, which is zero. And a very crucial aspect of this is that for this at least example, even though in the first case, there could be a huge distance between those two points, you see it here because between the lowest and the highest point that go there, for points that are not in the image, the L and the R are covering so much of them. Because if there would be something, it would have to go there or there and it would change the L or the R. So that's, that's the crucial aspect we use design these diagrams correctly and make sure that the L's and the R's are computed correctly. Because in the end, we don't want a diagram where the G has an L on it or an R. We want an actual diagram that has only the G's and the F's, no inverses on that. We just cannot do it cheaply by reversing the R or the L. So that's the whole point, the whole complication is how do you make sure that these are correctly computed? So this is what I just said in words. This is the, these two pictures uh, of how to do it. This works on Z. Yes. You don't want to find this in the picture. I do. I just wanted for educational purposes to start with something concrete. Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Is it really enough to consider functions that are uh, finite to one and on two? Finite to one. And at the same time, also no, because then L is uh -huh. so, so as I said here, if you take a point, the FL is less or equal to the FL of two, and the FR of two are comparable, so that the FL is below the FR. But if you take a point that's not in the image the calculation reverses this order. So Dre is saying that at least you would just get something where F then would be always consistent that, that would be an FR. So this much. equation. Yeah, but also the FL would be under. That's another problem. No, yeah. yeah. So if you, you oh, yeah. take one function that has this property, but it's L, yeah, wouldn't have, have that property. Yes. So it's not closed under L and R. So this is how you generalize in general. You just remind yourself of the definition of uh, what, what it means for two maps to be a residual pair, or for G to be the upper residual or upper adjoint of F, or the F to be the lower adjoint of G, uh, dual residual, so many ways to say this. This is the reform this adjunction. So in this case, um, I will give a name to the G because if the such a G exists, it's unique. There's only one G that can for which can help, or no G. So that's the name we give it. If that's a T exists, we call it F to the R. That's the residual of F, if it has a residual. If you're talking about G, then the F corresponding to it is called the lower, the, the dual residual. And then I'm calling it, call it the G, I'm gonna call F, G, L. So if a function, Function S has an upper residual G, that's going to be denoted by F to the R. If function G has a lower residual F, that's going to be called G to the L. And this is the formulas that give you the lower and the upper residual when they exist. So we want functions that have these things. And likewise, you can define higher order residuals. Your residual has a lower residual, but it may also have a higher, an upper residual. I want that to exist because I want my lower upper residual to also have this property. So in the end, we want um, f of z contains precisely the functions from t to z that have residuals and dual residuals of all possible order. Every function is residuated. It's also the residual of something and those forever. And that's how we define this for an arbitrary chain, because this finite one doesn't make sense for arbitrary chains, but this way it does. So 
to be observed back, but we were writing the book in 2007, we put it as a homework problem, but we didn't work a lot on it. Um, but anyways, this is called, instead of odd of z, you could like f of z for functions on z, functional algorithm. These functional ones are also special because they are distributed. They're um, on a chain. The functions um, to a chain, so they are distributed in target. Because the ordering is just one point. Um, and all distributive ones are of this form. So this is the Cayley colon type theorem for distributive L pregroups. Is it true for L group? L pregroups in general, I don't know, are all L pregroups distributive? <laughs> if you're trying to prove the distributivity from the axioms of an L group, um, you can get it in like two, three lines. But here, two, three lines will not do it for sure. But the conjecture is that it doesn't hold, but I don't know, nobody knows, people don't know. I'll tell you what we do know, but we don't know about this. And Isis and I have been trying to construct the counterexample before we started working on this. And after a year we just said, okay, let's pause it and let someone needs to get a PhD here. Let's prove some stuff that we can actually get the answer. Um, then we will get back to it. But everybody, please, please, everybody, lots of people want to know the answer to this. Is it, is it true or not? Can you find an undistributed well per group? Um, so, um, just to remind you, um, weaker versions of distributivity is semi-distributivity. So join, uh, meet, meet semi-distributivity is this implication. If um, X meets the same way with uh, Y and Z, it will also meet the same way with their join. And the analog for join semi-distributivity. If you have both of them, then we call the lattice semi-distributive. And distributed lattices are semi-distributive, so this is a generalization, a relaxing of that. Um, if you are either joined or mid semi-distributive, then you avoid M3. So you may still have N5 inside. So it's half of distributivity if you want, in some sense, um, because the distributed lattices are exactly the ones that avoid both M3 and N5. So that's what we were able to prove that at least that much holds. L3 groups are semi-distributed. So in particular, they contain non m 3 So the example that Isis and I were trying to construct starts with something that has an N5 and tries to build an infinite thing around it and it's a mess. We don't know if it even, even that it's an So there is a little bit of distributivity here. So for example, X, Y, and Z here, these primed versions, work whenever you take L to some specific one of these forms, any of the one of these forms will satisfy the distributive distributive property, but it holds for special kind of elements. So you don't quite get distributivity unless you have this form for the elements. Um, but this is enough to prove that at least you get semi-distributivity. And as another corollary, we get what Jose was mentioning that this is L3 groups are torsion free. So if you have uh, an, an, uh, a power greater or equal to one, the X must already be greater or equal to one. And if it's equal to one, X must be equal to one. So you cannot have torsion inside. Also, you can get that L, L pregroup satisfy the law of excluded middle. Uh, it's the theorem that X or not X. And you can use the other inverse there as well. So this is what we know so far, but we don't know if it's distributive or not. That's a no. This is another positive result, is that um, another big class of L3 groups are distributed. Maybe not all of them, but these, these are. What are these? These are what we call periodic. So the example I had before, I call this function A, is periodic because it repeats itself with period two. So that's what we call periodic. But you can also write it um, in an equation. Actually, if you have your A and you compute your AL, somehow it shifts like that. And if you compute the AR, it also shifts, but it's higher up. And if you compute the double L, in this case, it will coincide with the double R because the period will catch up when you just move it to another period. And it's a repeat of A, just higher. So double L, um, 
is always having you this gives you this feature. Just moves one spot up the function. And if you join A with this result, what you get is actually a translation, one of the translations we saw here. Um, and and um, you can define it equationally and periodic now. This is two periodic, means that here it was two L's is equal to two R's, and periodic is n many L's is equal to n many R's. You can, of course, rewrite this by just, um, because L, N and R's are inverse of each other, I should have mentioned that, double L is not equal to the identity, but if you do L and R, or R and L, then they do give you it. So they're inverses of each other, but they could pile up. You can have L of L of L of L of L of N go on forever. Um, two L's will just shift you one up, and then two more L's will shift you more up, and so on. But if, you, so if you're not periodic, you can just have generally different functions that you produce from this thing. Um, but you, sorry? I was just checking if A and A body have anything in common. They don't agree on any specific element, yes. Yeah. But if you take double, uh, uh, B bar, B bar will be the same as B. Um, so you can rewrite this equation if you want by moving all of the L's here, you can have A to the quadruple L is equal to A, if you prefer to write to do this that way. But in any case, this is a variety. And um, that's what we proved with Peter, that if you're periodic, if you have an L group that uh, satisfies this identity, all of your elements are N periodic or fixed N, then this particular um, L group consisting of those functions will be distributed. And um, this um, one periodic is L groups. The one periodic L pregroups are exactly the very special case of L groups. So this in particular implies that all L groups are distributed. Um, this is the picture of this particular one that I mentioned. This is the A. The A is here, the A R, the A L, um, the identity, the A bar, which is those two, and the join of these two B, which is a group element. And you can take B times B and so on. It, it, it generates a copy of Z, the B. Um, and you can see that on the left chain, you take A and you take all products of A by different powers of B. Here are all products of A bar with um, powers of B, and these are the one times power of B. So three chains interweave here. What was the A bar again? Oh, it says A, L, L. Yes, in this case, they do coincide. So mm -hmm. um, if you have three periodic, then this is wider because A, a double L, a quadruple L are these things, and then it switches back to that. So these things get fatter, and also they're not, you don't have these elements that are conical. You have fatter things maybe, and more, more interweave, but you can always find some L group Z inside it. If you just take enough joints of these correct elements, and you can use this to, that's how we, we so, um, I'm almost out of time. <laughs> but um, I wanted to mention that these connect nicely to the um, that we're studying the residuated lattice is because uh, there is this notion of an involutive residuated lattice, which is a monoid um, and a lattice subject to this condition that you can solve an inequality of this form for B by moving the A to the other side or keeping the A there but moving the B to the other side. Um, L and R switch, I mean, are inverse of each other. And what I mean by plus here is that the Morgan dual of times. So you've already seen examples of this. First of all, cyclic one means that L and R coincide. 
But Boolean algebras are exactly the ones, the cyclic ones, where NL are coincide, further multiplication is neat. The, this is the residuation property for Boolean algebras. This is neat, and this becomes joint, this becomes negation. We've also seen that, uh, maybe you've seen that in relation algebras. In relation algebras, they're exactly one, the ones which have a um, Boolean part. So this is a Boolean algebra, namely a cyclic involutive with this. And it has also another part, which is the composition of relations. That's the dynamic part, as it's called. And that one also forms another one of those with no restriction of Booleanness. So that's what the uh, Tarski's uh, relation algebras are. Two of those guys, one of which is Boolean, the other is completely unrestricted. And they're linked by a single property here, which says that the, the Boolean negation doesn't just act in a De Morgan way between the join and the meet, it also acts in a De Morgan way with respect plus and the minus of the other guy. So this axiomatization is equivalent to Tarski's 10 axioms um, for relation algebra, but it's more symmetric because now it, it tells you what that is. Um, and we've also seen L groups. If you have L groups, how do you get this? Well, then L and R are just inverse. And then um, plus is exactly the same thing as times. If I multiply on the left by A inverse, it will cancel the A and put it here. So this becomes times. Actually, L groups are precisely these that have plus equal to times. And L pregroups are exactly the ones where plus is equal to times, but you don't require that they're cyclic. You allow for the uh, full uh, aspect of involutive residualities with two inverses. So that's why they're special. L pregroups are, have a natural place in the study of uh, involutive residualities. And the ones with the two natural operations, but they're just the more conduits of each other are the same. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the one gets fixed by this. Um, So with Peter in a different paper, we proved that if you take the periodic, the periodicity condition makes sense in general in this context of involutive If you take the n-periodic involute, the variety of n-periodic, and you change the n, you get different varieties. If you take the joint of all of those varieties, you will get the variety, the whole variety of involutive And this is a difficult proof because we had to use both algebraic proofs as for part of the proof and proof theoretic pr proofs for the other part. So we would be very interested in, in the purely algebraic proof of this fact, but we don't have it so far. In any case, it's true. And it begs the question what happens with L groups and the same thing actually, L pregroups happens. The join of the periodic L pregroups is exactly the variety of distributive ones. So, and I'm, we're interested in involutive residue lattices because we're actually interested in residue lattices, and they, this is how you can define involutive from them. But the, exa the examples are now many more. Hiding algebras are allowed, the edge of rings are monoids, and they connect to substructure logics. So that's why we're interested in involutive residue lattices. So um, I can just highlight the results now in the um, five minutes maybe that I have. And these are what? That we want generating now algebras for the variety of distributed L pregroups. And we suspect that if we took take a correct chain here and we put it, it's going to work. Okay, so the first thing you want to try is the real numbers because that did work for L groups. And now we're allowing more than just the bijections. So we're going to take F of R. Unfortunately, F of R is the same thing as out of R. Um, it doesn't help you that you relax the condition for these functions. So because every point is a limit point, it has to do also not with density, but also with limit points here. Um, on the other hand, you could try to say, I'll just take Z here. 
the chain Z, which definitely didn't do, make the cut for L groups, it would give you a billion L groups. So now we have more general types of functions. Who knows, right? Um, and then um, this generates a lot of these things that, like, for example, the picture that I had before, this thing sits inside f of z because this was just a periodic energy. So it generates interesting um, new types of elements that are not one to one. But if you look at the one to one elements in f of z, they're only the translations. So it doesn't seem to have enough power in terms of the L group to capture all the L groups. So this seems cheap in that respect. So it was a surprise that it does work. This is a correct statement. F of z does work. Every, every L group equation that you want to fail, you can fail it here, not on the skeleton of it, not by using permutations, but by using other kind of functions that are not permutations, but still serve to cancel them. So, so this is the main result that we proved. And the other main result is that we can also develop the theory of diagrams for this by capturing um, diagrams. Now we have to throw many more elements to protect the calculation of the L and the R. And we have to encode certain things as being a cover because these are gonna be the covering between some L and the R that will have to be. So I have some pictures for this. Um, so here, for example, is a, an instructive picture. Here's the, the function you want to capture. Um, because maybe you're looking at this identity. This is an identity that fails um, in L pre groups. It actually fails in F of Z already, but this is to illustrate what's happening. So the L, remember, is the thing that if you apply it on the left, it gets you less or equal to one. The R is the one that takes you above. So this is the, the wrong thing, and that's why this equation fails. But what is a specific failure in a specific thing? Take this function from Z to Z, and then evaluate it at seven. At seven, if you take, um, let's see how to do this. Um, this is your X, plug in seven, you get F of seven, which is five, and then feed it into FL. Here I have the picture of FL, so five will go to four. So this side will take it to four, and it's not gonna be greater or equal to the other side. It's gonna be smaller than the other side. That's the identity on seven um, that will keep the seven there. So that's the failure. So how do we make a diagram out of this? Well, you could say just keep, uh, keep the, the, the elements that are needed, which is what? Uh, seven, five, and four, right? But, and, and keep the fact that f of seven is five. And you would say keep also the fact that fl of five is four, but I don't want to have fl on this side. I want to have just the information in terms of the f. I want to draw an f. And then something similar to Peter's algorithm will check if it satisfies some final set of conditions and do the job for me. If I just prescribe that this is FL, who knows if FL is, if there is an F that, let alone this F that has that as the FL and so on. So I have to translate this red line into information about F. Not about F, actually about the restriction of F to some finite set that I'm calling G to be precise because, um, so G is just um, the restriction of F to a suitable finite thing. And now to protect the fact that FL of five has to be four. Let's see, why was F, FL of five four? Because five is in the image and FL is just this. But if you only keep that, how could you fail to have the same calculation? Well, what if F of three was also five? If you take that thing and stupidly embed it into some uh, extension, and that extension sends three to five, then FL of five wouldn't be four, it would be three. So I wanna make sure that four goes to five, but also nothing smaller than four goes to five. In particular, the thing smaller than four, directly above four, that's the green line that has to exist between the FL and the FR of, let's say, these points, goes to where it's supposed to go. So I also have to throw in three, that line and two. So I have to throw a few more elements and also the requirement that goes as part of the of this that three is a covering of four. So if someone embeds it, they will not put elements in here that will go to five either. They will have that it's as a rigid separate. thing, separate and, and do that. 
So how do we capture those elements? Well, these elements have to be known from the equation itself. They have to have these kind of labels, reasons for existing. But they don't have reasons like these. They have the reason three has the reason that it is the lower, the, the predecessor of an element that's important. How many predecessors, how many successors you had? This, this depends on how many else or R's you have to do, and actually how many stacks of else you have on top of each other. The more else you have to unravel this, so you have to do this and you have to play this game back and forth. So the whole picture here looks like this. These are the sets you have to consider. You have to take your A, you have to take the image under these many L's and then either go up or down, this is a sign, or stay the same or go to the predecessor and then apply another lower level and go all the way down to these many. So there's a lot of many more points you have to add to protect a deep inside uh, F L calculation. But you can work on this out and, um, and then you can, from an equation, construct those signed points. So we do have an example of this. Or actually. Ah, yes, these are the sign points. So for example, here for our case, you have to take f of seven, you have to take that, you have to make the predecessor of that, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the new set of elements you have to take, closing here. So these are the elements. So I ask you to believe that there are finitely many points we need to uh, f uh, add to this computable directly from the equation. And what's interesting to us was that we have to expand our language to include these predecessors and successors that are not part of the language of, uh, of uh, L groups, L pre groups. Yeah, sorry, two? that's not correct. No, that's no, something, no, no, no. something like two and seven. Okay. Two and seven yes, yeah. thank you. Um, so um, these these things that are not in our language, where where are they? What what this is? What is this minus? This is the the, the predecessor. It's the, it's the predecessor. It's the predecessor function. It's the predecessor function on your chain. So if you have a chain, what is the predecessor function? It takes the element right below it, if it exists. So before we prove that, we proved another result that says that it's an enhanced version of the Cayley's theorem that says that if you have a failure in some chain, then you have the failure in an integral chain. Um, here. Um, so every distributor could be buried in f of omega where omega can now be taken to be an integral chain. What is an integral chain? Every point has a predecessor and a successor and a predecessor and those have, so it's locally Z. So it's, it's a lexicographic product of Z. You can just only restrict to those chains, they will do the job for you. So that's why we allow ourselves to have this language of predecessor and successor. The predecessor and the successor function are defined on, on, on integral chains. But you get the finite, if only the finite, then you're in one of those comments. Exactly. Yes. Um, also, have a nice language of three orders to explain <laughs> all of that. Um, the situation with. So this is already on the archive. That's the, the paper that we have that essentially shows, it gives an upper bound for the diagrams. So it gives you the stability and it gives you the generation by f of z. And the same thing can happen here if you have the um, periodic ones. These varieties are also, um, they have a side of an equation on theory and you can have a generating algebra for them. It's just that it is a lexicographic product of Q with Z. And here you take the um, n periodic elements in this chain. So with a single chain, you can do, uh, by picking the periodic elements of this chain, we can, we can have uh, 
generation results for the for every n periodic sub variety. To prove the desirability for this, it's difficult because to control the size of the diagrams, okay, the period you can have, but the period itself can just take you to any slope. So we have to use some kind of like linear programming, uh, linear algebra kind of techniques to try to control, solve some systems of equations and so on, just to prove that you can control the size of the diagram. So that's, a, that's a difficult part, but um, we're still working on typing the details for that. Sorry for taking I feel that you can use f of z for all the distributed L3 groups. I mean, that was surprising because mm -hmm. I think Eric, Rick and, and you and I were talking about this and we yeah. thought it's going to need some kind of lexicographic product of yeah. many z's, r many of z's, or z many r's and stuff like that to mm -hmm. capture all possible behaviors of whether it's a limit point from below, from above, mm -hmm. and, and like all of them. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, but f of z is just a finite. Many finite to one, right? Yes. Otherwise, they're not in yes. Z. And you can do it with something a little bit smaller than f of z. Mm -hmm. f of z, you have a sub a sub algebra where you don't consider all finite to one. You can consider um, well, you can consider all of the periodic ones, for example. So first of all, you can fail it. That's what proves that the join of the periodics is all of. Um, all of this because you can just fail it if it fails it fails in a diagram just repeat it you have it in a periodic one so there are many ways to extend this right one way to extend it is just periodically extend it another way to extend it is um just keep it straight for the rest of the time and then this is a function with finite support so this as a subalgebra the finite support uh, subalgebra generates the whole thing as well. It generates the whole thing as well. Because if it fails, yeah, yeah, yeah. it fails yeah, in here. Finite, yeah. So I can yeah. replace that generating mm -hmm. by this one. Wow. And this is much smaller. This one actually is generated by um, a single element. <laughs> it's this element. It's like the A that we had before, the periodic A. What was it? Zero goes to zero, and one goes to one. Or two, sorry, this one. But um, the example I had it periodically extended. Now take this. Yeah. This is my a prime. Let's say this as an algebra is generated by that single a prime. Actually, as an algebra is generated by any of its members, any any non-trivial one. So it's a very simple. To generate algebra, like it has a small thing as you need. Um, so, hmm? yeah, so yes. simple, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh. You look at all the sub varieties of D, L, G, and inside yes. it you have the sub varieties of L group. Yes. Yeah, this is stuff. this is D, D. Actually, if you start putting the, uh, sorry, D, L, G one mm -hmm. is uh, L group. L groups, yes, yes. Which I mean has been studied, you know, mostly the lattice of some mm -hmm. so, 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 so. Yeah, so L groups yeah. has a single cover mm -hmm. and it has a single atom, which is the abelian. The normal value that means this is the trivial one. That's how the sub variety values of L groups. Oh, but yeah, it's uncountable here. It has countable chains and countable anti chains and stuff. Um, so this is just DLPG1. You also have DLPG2, and the join gives you DLPG. And potentially, LPG is different, but we don't know whether it's different or not. And there's more stuff in there. It's not the single chain, right? There's lots of things that we don't really know anything about. Do you know that there's more than this? 
I don't know. <laughs> I think I think there's a zoo of these things, but I haven't we haven't been able to spot the we haven't thought about like other sub varieties. Now there should be many, right? But I don't know. For example, yeah, take something that's that's not finite support. Take something that um, that that is like this, but then it goes like that. Take that function. This generates another subalgebra of z, and I I don't think you have enough power to falsify every diagram inside it. So that must be somewhere else. Um, yes, because if you have, um, you just check it for the images. If you have distributivity, F meet G or H is equal to that in G, F meet H. This is to find point. To find point wise and point wise it works. It, 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 it sits inside the infinite direct product power so that's of that chain. That's why it didn't have any hope that to find uh, FPG to be the variety of some. <laughs> it cannot. Uh, if, if these are distinct, it, it, it stops here. All yeah, of these yeah, are distinct. Yeah, but I mean, that you have this idea that change in automorphism with F. Mm -hmm. And you cannot. It, it's not, it's not, it's not a, a lack of imagination on what type of function to use. If you use any type of functions, it's going to be distributed. So you yes. have to move to something that's not a function. Exactly. Yeah, that's why you think, OK, let's see L and G is the algebra to start with, right? Exactly. You know, it has you know. to be an infinite algebra, non-distributive. So that's why we're trying with uh, with pieces. That, that what, yeah. what we did with pieces is we took one copy of this and another copy, and we tried to take some kind of like a a merge of the two, stack them in a way that the Pentagon is created, and then extend it. Which one of these sub can extend, but the other pieces that they generate is a whole level of other infinite other stuff that you get. You, have, uh, you call A the generator of this, and B the other, and you have A, B, A, B, A, B, and the L, and R. So so we would think about relations instead of algebra, uh, mm -hmm. functions. We would see many things and so on. Everything has everything simple has failed. Oh. But we tried. <laughs> there are many other simple things that we haven't thought about. <laughs> but this really works. Yeah. Presented functions respect arbitrary joins and uh, and those functions that think uh, uh, are. Uh, have all the residuals, all the co residuals. Uh, do you have any vision in terms of those functions should respect? They respect, of course, all joints because they have, you know, like they have. Uh, yeah. So, so I'll tell you what we do know about the integral chain. So, in general, um, if you have a function that has residual and the dual residual on a chain, the lattice is a chain, then you can prove this thing that if you have an element in the image, then the L is going to be below the R, and they're going to be close, the pre image is going to be a closed interval. And if you take an element not in the image, then the L and the R are going to be ordered the other way, and they're going to form a covering pair. And this element A is going to sit inside the open interval created by those things. That is just having a residual and a dual residual. Um, and of course, you also get other preservation from these properties. But the converse is also true. If you have, that's only for chains. If you have a map that, um, that is order preserving, and for every element this situation happens, then it will have a residual and a dual residual whether its residuals will have dual residuals or not, we don't know. That's why this is a, not enough to tell you that this is going to be an element in F of omega of the chain. But for integral chains, it is. For integral chains, 
having one residual and one dual residual will give you all of them for free. And this will be characterized by that. That's why integral chains are so nice and we wanted to move to them. So I don't know if this answers the question, but yeah, on yeah, integral yeah, chains, yes. if it's enough to look at integral chains, yes, yes, yes. Then, then this actually happens. For non integral chains, this fails miserably. The original question is that uh, residuals, uh, uh, functions that have a residual, so it will be the ones that respect the joints mm -hmm. have an access to the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so then the case more. Yeah. yeah, so in some sense, here, what you kind of get is that to be in f of omega, you exactly have to preserve all existing joints and all of them. Not a complete chain that I'm talking about. But it has that that feeling that it's exactly it should be exactly that uh, because there's arbitrary existing joints in if and only. Yeah, because you're yes. telling that, right? That, that, that yes, you have an L and you have an R, in this case you have a certain joint, and for you have to say that this is not to generate all the arms. So nothing more than just that mm -hmm. for the integral. Thing. For the integrals, but the, the non integral. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the, 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 I can imagine that for, for integrals work because the joints uh, are just the maximum. <laughs> well, this one is you know, tends to think. It's about these limit points because mm -hmm. the, the limit points, yes. we have some results here that tell you that um, if you have such an F, it's residued in a dual residuated. Then somehow, if you start with the limit point, this is limit points from below, yeah. this is input, then the image is also going to be a limit point, and vice versa, assuming some that it's in the image. Or here it says that, uh, assuming that in the image, if A is a limit point from below, then it's an L also of A will be a limit point. So these limit points are yes. preserved by these functions. But in an integral, Chain. You don't have limit. Have... Yeah, generally, the behavior has to do with if the function is locally one to one or not, somehow. And these limit points here. Yeah. But the other thing that we this came up, as I said, is the is the predecessor and the successor that's been defined from this. So the language uh, of of L3 group, distributed L3 groups, it seems that it can be conservatively be expanded to include two constants, the predecessor constant function, the constant that is a function that is the predecessor function, and the other, another, another single function that is the successor function. And they can be safely added to the language and you don't, you can decide equations even about those, you see. So there's some kind of well, extension. You can see same side. Exactly. Okay. And the same situation happens. Um, what we're looking with uh, with this is now is weakening relations. So the weakening relations on a chain. And then we can use the same ideas to essentially get this ability for that variety of where. So now we assume that omega is a chain because weakening relations can be defined on any process. Um, because what is, happens, this is isomorphic to just the residuated maps on O of omega. So we can switch from weakening relations to actual functions on these kind of chains are like perfect chains, right? Because this enough join irreducibles and enough meet irreducibles. These are special chains. And um, for some elements, you have this successor. And for enough of them, you have enough successors. So the same situation happens here. The variety generated by all of those um, is also decidable. And we can also do, like, take sub varieties if you take one specific, one specific chain, for example, as long as it has finitely many limit points, we can again get the setability for it. Um, Cannot get this ability for 
all of the varieties generated by such a thing, because there are countably many, there are only countably many algorithms to decide <laughs> those. So <laughs> that's a proof we cannot. <laughs> there are many undecidable ones. We don't know any of any. <laughs> we know of many decidable. Uh, Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, he's talking about. Uh,